Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we bring you two stories by Leo Tolstoy. God sees the truth but waits. The story that inspired Stephen King to write Shawshank Redemption, and Diary of a Lunatic. Tolstoy was a Russian writer who was regarded as one of the greatest authors of all time. He received multiple nominations for the Nobel Prize in Literature and the Nobel Peace Prize. He is the only nominee to ask to have his name removed from the list of nominees. In the 1870s, Tolstoy experienced a profound moral crisis, followed by what he regarded as an equally profound spiritual awakening. Tolstoy believed that a true Christian could find lasting happiness by striving for inner self-perfection through following the great commandment of loving one's neighbor and God, rather than looking outward to the church or state for guidance. His belief in non-resistance when faced with conflict is another distinct attribute of his philosophy based on Christ's teachings. By directly influencing Mahatma Gandhi, Tolstoy's profound influence on the non-violent resistance movement reverberates to this day. He believed that the aristocracy were a burden on the poor and that the only solution to how we live together is through anarchy. And now, two stories by Leo Tolstoy. God sees the truth, but waits. In the town of Vladimir lived a young merchant named Ivan Dmitrik Aksyonov. He had two shops and a house of his own. Aksyonov was a handsome, fair-haired, curly-headed fellow, full of fun and very fond of singing. When quite a young man, he had been given to drink and was riotous when he had had too much. But after he married, he gave up drinking, except now and then. One summer, Aksyonov was going to the Nizhny Fair, and as he bade goodbye to his family, his wife said to him, Ivan Dmitrik, do not start today. I have had a bad dream about you. Aksyonov laughed and said, You are afraid that when I get to the fair I shall go on a spree. His wife replied, I do not know what I am afraid of. All I know is that I had a bad dream. I dreamt you returned from the town, and when you took off your cap, I saw that your hair was gone quite gray. Aksyonov laughed. That's a lucky sign, said he. See if I don't sell all of my goods and bring you some presents from the fair. He said goodbye to his family and drove away. When he had traveled halfway, he met a merchant whom he knew, and they put up in the same inn for the night. They had some tea together and then went to bed in adjoining rooms. It was not Aksyonov's habit to sleep late, and wishing to travel while it was still cool, he aroused his driver before dawn and told him to put in the horses. Then he made his way across to the landlord of the inn, who lived in a cottage at the back, paid his bill, and continued his journey. When he had gone about twenty-five miles, he stopped for the horses to be fed. Aksyonov rested a while in the passage of the inn, then he stepped out into the porch, and ordering a samovar to be heated, got out his guitar and began to play. Suddenly a troika drove up with tinkling bells, and an official alighted, followed by two soldiers— he came to Aksyonov and began to question him, asking him who he was and whence he came. Aksyonov answered him fully and said, "'Won't you have some tea with me?' But the official went on cross-questioning and asking him, "'Where did you spend last night? Were you alone or with a fellow merchant? Did you see the other merchants this morning? Why did you leave the inn before dawn?' Aksyonov wondered why he was being asked all these questions, but he described all that had happened and then added, why do you cross-question me as if I were a thief or a robber? I am traveling on business of my own, and there is no need to question me. Then the official, calling the soldiers, said, I am the police officer of this district, and I question you because the merchant with whom you spent last night has been found with his throat cut. We must search your things. They entered the house. The soldiers and the police officer unstrapped Aksyonov's luggage and searched it. Suddenly, the officer drew a knife out of the bag, crying, "'Whose knife is this?' Aksyonov looked, and seeing a blood-stained knife taken from his bag, he was frightened. "'How is it there is blood on this knife?' Aksyonov tried to answer, but could hardly utter a word, and only stammered, "'I 
Don't know. Not mine. Then the officer said, This morning the merchant was found in bed with his throat cut. You are the only person who could have done it. The house was locked from inside, and no one else was there. Here is this blood-stained knife in your bag, and your face and manner betray you. Tell me how you killed him, and how much money you stole. Aksionov swore he had not done it, that he had not seen the merchant after they had had tea together, that he had no money except eight thousand roubles of his own, and that the knife was not his. But his voice was broken, and his face pale, and he trembled with fear as though he were guilty. The police officer ordered the soldiers to bind Aksionov and to put him in the cart. As they tied his feet together and flung him into the cart, Aksionov crossed himself and wept. His money and goods were taken from him, and he was sent to the nearest town and imprisoned there. Inquiries as to his character were made in Vladimir. The merchants and other inhabitants of the town said that, in former days, he used to drink and waste his time, but that he was a good man. Then the trial came on. He was charged with murdering a merchant from Ryazan and robbing him of twenty thousand roubles. His wife was in despair and did not know what to believe. Her children were all quite small. One was a baby at her breast. Taking them all with her, she went to the town where her husband was in jail. At first she was not allowed to see him, but after much begging she obtained permission from the officials and was taken to him. When she saw her husband in prison dress and in chains, shut up with thieves and criminals, she fell down and did not come to her senses for a long time. Then she drew her children to her and sat down near him. She told him of things at home and asked about what had happened to him. He told her, and she asked, "'What can we do now?' "'We must petition the Tsar not to let an innocent man perish.' His wife told him that she had sent a petition to the Tsar, but it had not been accepted. Aksionov did not reply, but only looked downcast. Then his wife said, "'It was not for nothing I dreamt your hair had turned grey. You remember? You should not have started that day.' And passing her fingers through his hair, she said, "'Vanya, dearest, tell your wife the truth. Was it not you who did it?' "'So you too suspect me,' said Aksionov, and hiding his face in his hands he began to weep. Then a soldier came to say that the wife and children must go away, and Aksionov said good-bye to his family for the last time. When they were gone, Aksionov recalled what had been said, and when he remembered that his wife had also suspected him, he said to himself, "'It seems that only God can know the truth. It is to him alone we must appeal, and from him alone expect mercy.' And Aksionov wrote no more petitions, gave up all hope, and only prayed to God. Aksionov was condemned to be flogged and sent to the mines. So he was flogged with a knot, and when the wounds made by the knot were healed, he was driven to Siberia with other convicts. For twenty-six years Aksionov lived as a convict in Siberia. His hair turned white as snow, and his beard grew long, thin, and gray. All his mirth went. He stooped. He walked slowly, spoke little, and never laughed. But he often prayed. In prison, Aksionov learned to make boots, and earned a little money with which he bought the lives of the saints. He read this book when there was light enough in the prison, and on Sundays in the prison church he read the lessons and sang in the choir, for his voice was still good. The prison authorities liked Aksionov, for his meekness and his fellow prisoners respected him. They called him Grandfather and the Saint. When they wanted to petition the prison authorities about anything, they always made Aksionov their spokesman, and when there were quarrels among the prisoners, they came to him to put things right and to judge the matter. No news reached Aksionov from his home, and he did not even know if his wife and children were still alive. One day, a fresh gang of convicts came to the prison. In the evening, the old prisoners collected around the new ones and asked them what towns or villages they came from and what they were sentenced for. Among the rest, Aksionov sat down near the newcomers and listened with downcast air to what was said. One of the new convicts, a tall, strong man of sixty, with a closely cropped grey beard, was telling the others what he had been arrested for. "'Well, friends,' he said, 
I only took a horse that was tied to a sledge, and I was arrested and accused of stealing. I said I had only taken it to get home quicker, and had then let it go. Besides, the driver was a personal friend of mine. So I said, it's all right. No, they said, you stole it. But how or where I stole it they could not say. I once really did something wrong, and ought by rights to have come here long ago. But that time I was not found out. Now I have been sent here for nothing at all. Eh, but it's lies I'm telling you. I've been to Siberia before, but I did not stay long. Where are you from? asked someone. From Vladimir. My family are of that town. My name is Makar, and they also call me Semyonich. Aksinov raised his head and said, Tell me, Semyonich, do you know anything of the merchants Aksinov of Vladimir? Are they still alive? Know them? Of course I do. The Aksinovs are rich, though their father is in Siberia. A sinner like ourselves, it seems. As for you, Grandad, how did you come here? Aksinov did not like to speak of his misfortune. He only sighed and said, For my sins I have been in prison these twenty-six years. What sins? asked Makar Semyonich. But Aksinov only said, Well, well, I must deserve it. He would have said no more, but his companions told the newcomers how Aksinov came to be in Siberia, how someone had killed a merchant and had put the knife among Aksinov's things, and Aksinov had been unjustly condemned. When Makar Semyonich heard this, he looked at Aksinov, slapped his own knee, and exclaimed, Well, this is wonderful, really wonderful. But how old you've grown, Grandad? The others asked him why he was so surprised, and where he had seen Aksinov before. But Makar Semyonich did not reply. He only said, it's wonderful that we should meet here, lads. These words made Aksinov wonder whether this man knew who had killed the merchant. So he said, Perhaps, Semyonich, you have heard of that affair? Or maybe you've seen me before? How could I help hearing? The world is full of rumors. But it's a long time ago, and I've forgotten what I heard. Perhaps you heard who killed the merchant? asked Aksinov. Makar Semyonich laughed and replied, It must have been him in whose bag the knife was found. If someone else hid the knife there, he's not a thief till he's caught, as the saying is. How could anyone put a knife into your bag while it was under your head? It would surely have woke you up. When Aksinov heard these words, he felt sure this was the man who had killed the merchant. He rose and went away. All that night Aksinov lay awake, he felt terribly unhappy, and all sorts of images rose in his mind. There was the image of his wife, as she was when he parted from her to go to the fair. He saw her as if she were present. Her face and her eyes rose before him. He heard her speak and laugh. Then he saw his children, quite little, as they were at that time, one with a little cloak on, another at his mother's breast. And then he remembered himself as he used to be, young and merry, he remembered how he sat playing the guitar in the porch of the inn where he was arrested, and how free from care he had been. He saw in his mind the place where he was flogged, the executioner and the people standing around, the chains, the convicts, all the twenty-six years of his prison life, and his premature old age. The thought of it all made him so wretched that he was ready to kill himself. And it's all that villain's doing thought Aksionov, and his anger was so great against Makar Semyonich that he longed for vengeance, even if he himself should perish for it. He kept repeating prayers all night, but he could get no peace. During the day he did not go near Makar Semyonich, nor even look at him. A fortnight passed in this way. Aksionov could not sleep at night, and was so miserable that he did not know what to do. One night, as he was walking about the prison, he noticed some earth that came rolling out from under one of the shelves on which the prisoners slept. He stopped to see what it was. Suddenly, Makar Semyonich crept out from under the shelf and looked up at Aksionov with frightened face. Aksionov tried to pass without looking at him, but Makar seized his hand and told him that he had dug a hole under the wall, getting rid of the earth by putting it into his high boots, 
and emptying it out every day on the road when the prisoners were driven to their work. Just you keep quiet, old man, and you shall get out too. If you blab, they'll flog the life out of me, but I will kill you first. Aksionov trembled with anger as he looked at his enemy. He drew his hand away, saying, I have no wish to escape, and you have no need to kill me. You killed me long ago. As to telling of you, I may do so or not, as God shall direct. Next day, when the convicts were led out to work, the convoy soldiers noticed that one or other of the prisoners emptied some earth out of his boots. The prison was searched and the tunnel found. The governor came and questioned all the prisoners to find out who had dug the hole. They all denied any knowledge of it. Those who knew would not betray Makar Semyonich, knowing he would be flogged almost to death. At last the governor turned to Aksionov, whom he knew to be a just man, and said, You are a truthful old man. Tell me before God. Who dug the hole? Makar Semyonich stood as if he were quite unconcerned, looking at the governor and not so much as glancing at Aksionov. Aksionov's lips and hands trembled, and for a long time he could not utter a word. He thought, Why should I screen him who ruined my life? Let him pay for what I have suffered. But if I tell, they will probably flog the life out of him, and maybe I suspect him wrongly. And after all, what good would it be to me? Well, old man, repeated the governor, tell me the truth. Who has been digging under the wall? Aksionov glanced at Makar Semyonich and said, I cannot say, Your Honor. It is not God's will that I should tell. Do what you like with me. I am in your hands. However much the governor tried, Aksionov would say no more, and so the matter had to be left. That night, when Aksionov was lying on his bed and just beginning to doze, someone came quietly and sat down on his bed. He peered through the darkness and recognized Makar. "'What more do you want of me?' asked Aksionov. "'Why have you come here?' Makar Semyonich was silent. So Aksionov sat up and said, "'What do you want? Go away or I will call the guard.' Makar Semyonich bent close over Aksionov and whispered, "'Ivan Dmitrik, forgive me.' "'What for?' asked Aksionov. It was I who killed the merchant and hid the knife among your things. I meant to kill you too, but I heard a noise outside, so I hid the knife in your bag and escaped out of the window. Aksionov was silent and did not know what to say. Makar Semyonich slid off the bed shelf and knelt upon the ground. Ivan Dmitrik, said he, forgive me. For the love of God, forgive me. I will confess that it was I who killed the merchant, and you will be released and can go to your home. It is easy for you to talk, said Aksionov, but I have suffered for you these twenty-six years. Where could I go now? My wife is dead, and my children have forgotten me. I have nowhere to go. Makar Semyonich did not rise. He beat his head on the floor. Ivan Dmitrik, forgive me! he cried. When they flogged me with the knot, it was not so hard to bear as it was to see you now. Yet you had pity on me and did not tell. For Christ's sake, forgive me, wretch that I am. And he began to sob. When Aksionov heard him sobbing, he too began to weep. God will forgive you, said he. Maybe I am a hundred times worse than you. And at these words his heart grew light, and the longing for home left him. He no longer had any desire to leave the prison, but only hoped for his last hour to come. In spite of what Aksionov had said, Makar Semyonich confessed his guilt. But when the order for his release came, Aksionov was already dead. Diary of a Lunatic This morning I underwent a medical examination in the government council room. The opinions of the doctors were divided. They argued among themselves and came at last to the conclusion that I was not mad. But this was due to the fact that I tried hard during the examination not to give myself away. I was afraid of being sent to the lunatic asylum, 
where I would not be able to go on with the mad undertaking I have on my hands. They pronounced me subject to fits of excitement and something else, too, but nevertheless of sound mind. The doctor prescribed a certain treatment and assured me that by following his directions my trouble would completely disappear. Imagine all that torments me disappearing completely. Oh, there is nothing I would not give to be free from my trouble. The suffering is too great. I am going to tell explicitly how I came to undergo that examination, how I went mad, and how my madness was revealed to the outside world. Up to the age of thirty-five, I lived like the rest of the world, and nobody had noticed any peculiarities in me. Only in my early childhood, before I was ten, I had occasionally been in a mental state similar to the present one, and then only at intervals, whereas now I am continually conscious of it. I remember going to bed one evening when I was a child of five or six. Nurse Euprasia, a tall, lean woman in a brown dress with a double chin, was undressing me and was just lifting me up to put me into bed. "'I will go to bed myself,' I said, preparing to step over the net at the bedside. "'Lie down, Vadinka. You see, Matinka is already lying quiet,' she said, pointing with her head to my brother in his bed. I jumped into my bed, still holding the nurse's hand in mine. Then I let it go, stretched my legs under the blanket, and wrapped myself up. I felt so nice and warm. I grew silent all of a sudden and began thinking. I love Nurse. Nurse loves me and Matinka. I love Matinka, too, and he loves me and Nurse. And Nurse loves Taras. I love Taras, too, and so does Matinka. And Taras loves me and Nurse. And Mother loves me and Nurse. Nurse loves mother and me and father. Everybody loves everybody, and everybody is happy. Suddenly the housekeeper rushed in and began to shout in an angry voice something about a sugar basin she could not find. Nurse got cross and said she did not take it. I felt frightened. It was all so strange. A cold horror came over me, and I hid myself under the blanket. But I felt no better in the darkness under the blanket. I thought of a boy who had got a thrashing one day in my presence— of his screams, and of the cruel face of Foka when he was beating the boy. "'Then you won't do it any more, you won't,' he repeated, and went on beating. "'I won't,' said the boy, and Foka kept on repeating over and over, "'You won't, you won't,' and did not cease to strike the boy. That was when my madness came over me for the first time. I burst into sobs, and they could not quiet me for a long while— the tears and despair of that day were the first signs of my present trouble. I well remember the second time my madness seized me. It was when Aunt was telling us about Christ. She told his story and got up to leave the room, but we held her back. "'Tell us more about Jesus Christ,' we said. "'I must go,' she replied. "'No, tell us more, please,' Matinka insisted. And she repeated all she had said before. She told us how they crucified him— how they beat and martyred him, and how he went on praying and did not blame them. Auntie, why did they torture him? Well, they were wicked. But wasn't he God? Oh, be still. It is nine o'clock. Don't you hear the clock striking? Why did they beat him? He had forgiven them. Then why did they hit him? Did it hurt him, Auntie? Did it hurt? Oh, be quiet, I say. I'm going to the dining room to have tea now. But perhaps it never happened— Perhaps he was not beaten by them. I am going. No, Auntie, don't go. And again my madness took possession of me. I sobbed and sobbed and began knocking my head against the wall. Such had been my fits of madness in my childhood. But after I was fourteen, from the time the instincts of sex awoke and I began to give way to vice, my madness seemed to have passed, and I was a boy like other boys— just as happens with all of us who are brought up on rich, overabundant food and are spoiled and made effeminate because we never do any physical work and are surrounded by all possible temptations which excite our sensual nature when in the company of other children, similarly spoiled. So I had been taught vice by other boys of my age, and I indulged in it. As time passed, other vices came to take the place of the first. I began to know women— 
And so I went on living up to the time I was thirty-five, looking out for all kinds of pleasures and enjoying them. I had a perfectly sound mind then, and never a sign of madness. Those twenty years of my normal life passed without leaving any special record on my memory. And now it is only with a great effort of mind, and with utter disgust, that I can concentrate my thoughts upon that time. Like all boys of my set, who were of sound mind, I entered school, passed on to the university, and went through a course of law studies. Then I entered the state service for a short time, married and settled down in the country, educating, if our way of bringing up children can be called educating, my children, looking after the land and filling the post of a justice of the peace. It was when I had been married ten years that one of those attacks of madness I suffered in my childhood made its appearance again. My wife and I had saved up money from her inheritance and from some government bonds of mine which I had sold, and we decided that with that money we ought to buy another estate. I was naturally keen to increase our fortune, and to do it in the shrewdest way, better than anyone else would manage it. I went about inquiring what estates were to be sold, and used to read all the advertisements in the papers. What I wanted was to buy an estate, the produce or timber of which would cover the cost of purchase, and then I would have the estate practically for nothing. I was looking out for a fool who did not understand business, and there came a day when I thought I had found one. An estate with large forests attached to it was to be sold in the Pensa government. To judge by the information I had received, the proprietor of that estate was exactly the imbecile I wanted, and I might expect the forests to cover the price asked for the whole estate. I got my things ready and was soon on my way to the estate I wished to inspect. We had to first go by train. I had taken my manservant with me, then by coach, with relays of horses at the various stations. The journey was very pleasant, and my servant, a good-natured youth, liked it as much as I did. We enjoyed the new surroundings and the new people, and having now only two hundred miles more to drive, we decided to go on without stopping, except to change horses at the stations. Night came on, and we were still driving. I had been dozing, but presently I awoke, seized with a sudden fear. As often happens in such a case, I was so excited that I was thoroughly awake, and it seemed as if sleep were gone forever. Why am I driving? Where am I going? I suddenly asked myself. It was not that I disliked the idea of buying an estate at a bargain, but it seemed at that moment so senseless to journey to such a faraway place, and I had a feeling as if I were going to die there, away from home. I was overcome with terror. My servant, Sergius, awoke. I took advantage of the fact to talk to him, I began to remark upon the scenery around us. He had also a good deal to say of the people at home and of the pleasure of the journey, and it seemed strange to me that he could talk so gaily. He appeared so pleased with everything, and in such good spirits, whereas I was annoyed with it all. Still, I felt more at ease when I was talking with him. Along with my feelings of restlessness and my secret horror, however, I was fatigued as well, and longed to break the journey somewhere. It seemed to me my uneasiness would cease if I could only enter a room, have tea, and what I desired most of all, sleep. We were approaching the town Arzamas. Don't you think we had better stop here and have a rest? Why not? It's an excellent idea. How far are we from the town? I asked the driver. Another seven miles. The driver was a quiet, silent man. He was driving rather slowly and wearily. We drove on. I was silent, but I felt better, looking forward to a rest and hoping to feel better for it. We drove on and on in the darkness, and the seven miles seemed to have no end. At last we reached the town. It was sound asleep at that early hour. First came the small houses, piercing the darkness, and as we passed them the noise of our jingling bells and the trotting of our horses sounded louder. In a few places the houses were large and white, but I did not feel less dejected for seeing them. I was waiting for the station and the samovar and longed to lie down and rest. At last we approached a house with pillars in front of it. The house was white, but it seemed to me very melancholy. I felt even frightened at its aspect and stepped slowly out of the carriage. Sergius was busying himself with our luggage, taking what we needed for the night, running about and stepping heavily on the doorsteps. 
The sound of his brisk tread increased my weariness. I walked in and came into a small passage. A man received us. He had a large spot on his cheek, and that spot filled me with horror. He asked us into a room which was just an ordinary room. My uneasiness was growing. "'Could we have a room to rest in?' I asked. "'Oh, yes, I have a very nice room at your disposal, a square room, newly whitewashed.' The fact of the little room being squared was, I remember it so well, most painful to me. It had one window with a red curtain, and table of birchwood and a sofa with a curved back and arms. Sergius boiled the water in the samovar and made the tea. I put a pillow on the sofa in the meantime and lay down. I was not asleep. I heard Sergius busy with the samovar and urging me to have tea. I was afraid to get up from the sofa, afraid of driving away sleep. And just to be sitting in that room seemed awful. I did not get up, but fell into a sort of doze. When I started up out of it, nobody was in the room and it was quite dark. I woke up with the very same sensation I had the first time, and knew sleep was gone. Why am I here? Where am I going? Just as I am, I must be forever. Neither the pension nor any other estate will add to or take away anything from me. As for me, I am unbearably weary of myself. I want to go to sleep, to forget, and I cannot, I cannot get rid of self. I went out into the passage. Sergius was sleeping there on a narrow bench, his hand hanging down beside it. He was sleeping soundly, and the man with the spot on his cheek was also asleep. I thought by going out of the room to get away from what was tormenting me, but it followed me and made everything seem dark and dreary. My feeling of horror instead of leaving me was increasing. What nonsense, I said to myself. Why am I so dejected? What am I afraid of? You are afraid of me. I heard the voice of death. I am here. I shuddered. Yes, death. Death will come, and it ought not to come. Even in facing actual death, I would certainly not feel anything of what I felt now. Then it would be simply fear, whereas now it was more than that. I was actually seeing, feeling the approach of death, and along with it, I felt that death ought not to exist. My entire being was conscious of the necessity to the right to live, and at the same time of the inevitability of dying. This inner conflict was causing me unbearable pain. I tried to shake off the horror. I found a half-burnt candle in a brass candlestick and lighted it. The candle with its red flame burnt down until it was not much taller than the low candlestick. The same thing seemed to be repeated over and over. Nothing lasts. Life is not. All is death. But death ought not to exist. I tried to turn my thoughts to what had interested me before, to the estate I was to buy and to my wife. Far from being a relief, these seem nothing to me now. To feel my life doomed, to be taken from me, was a terror shutting out any other thought. I must try to sleep, I decided. I went to bed. But the next instant I jumped up, seized with horror. A sickness came over me, a spiritual sickness not unlike the physical uneasiness preceding actual illness, but in the spirit, not in the body. A terrible fear, similar to the fear of death, when mingled with the recollections of my past life, developed into a horror, as if life were departing. Life and death were flowing into one another. An unknown power was trying to tear my soul into pieces, but I could not bend it. Once more I went out into the passage to look at the two men asleep. Once more I tried to go to sleep. The horror was always the same, now red, now white and square. Something was tearing within but could not be torn apart. A torturing sensation. An arid hatred deprived me of every spark of kindly feeling. Just a dull and steady hatred against myself and against that which had created me. What did create me? God? We say God. What if I tried to pray? I suddenly thought. I had not said a prayer for more than twenty years, and I had no religious sentiment, although just for formality's sake I fasted and partook of the communion every year. I began saying prayers. God forgive me, our Father, our Lady, 
I was composing new prayers, crossing myself, bowing to the earth, looking around me all the while for fear I might be discovered in my devotional attitude. The prayer seemed to divert my thoughts from the previous terror, but it was more the fear of being seen by somebody that did it. I went to bed again, but the moment I shut my eyes, the very same feeling of terror made me jump up. I could not stand it any longer. I called the hotel servant, roused Sergius from his sleep, ordered him to harness the horses to the carriage, and we were soon driving on once more. The open air and the drive made me feel much better. But I realized that something new had come into my soul and had poisoned the life I had lived up to that hour. We reached our destination in the evening. The whole day long I remained struggling with despair and finally conquered it, but a horror remained in the depth of my soul. It was as if a misfortune had happened to me, and although I was able to forget it for a while, it remained at the bottom of my soul, and I was entirely dominated by it. The manager of the estate, an old man, received us in a friendly manner, though not exactly with great joy. He was sorry that the estate had to be sold. The clean little rooms with upholstered furniture, a new shining samovar on the tea table, nice large cups, honey served with the tea. Everything was pleasant to see. I began questioning him about the estate without any interest, as if I were repeating a lesson learned long ago and nearly forgotten. It was so uninteresting. But that night I was able to sleep without feeling miserable. I thought this was due to having said my prayers again before going to bed. After that incident I resumed my ordinary life, but the apprehension that this horror would again come upon me was continual. I had to live my usual life without any respite, not giving way to my thoughts, just like a schoolboy who repeats by habit and without thinking the lesson learned by heart. That was the only way to avoid being seized again by the horror and the despair I had experienced in Arzamaz. I had returned home safe from my journey. I had not bought the estate. I had not enough money. My life at home seemed to be just as it had always been, save for my taking to saying prayers and going to church. But now, when I recollect that time, I see that I only imagined my life to be the same as before. The fact was, I merely continued what I had previously started, and was running with the same speed on rails already laid. But I did not undertake anything new. Even in those things which I had already taken in hand, my interest had diminished. I was tired of everything, and was growing very religious. My wife noticed this, and was often vexed with me for it. No new fit of distress occurred while I was at home, but one day I had to go unexpectedly to Moscow, where a lawsuit was pending. In the train I entered into conversation with a landowner from Kharkov. We were talking about the management of estates, about bank business, about the hotels in Moscow and the theatres. We both decided to stop at the Moscow court in the Meznikea Street and go that evening to the opera, to Faust. When we arrived, I was shown into a small room, the heavy smell of the passage being still in my nostrils. The porter brought in my portmanteau and then lighted the candle, the flame of which burned up brightly and then flickered as it usually does. In the room next to mine, I heard somebody coughing, probably an old man, the maid went out, and the porter asked whether I wished him to open my bag. In the meanwhile, the candle flame had flared up, throwing its light on the blue wallpaper with yellow stripes, on the partition, on the shabby table, on the small sofa in front of it, on the mirror hanging on the wall, and on the window. I saw what the small room was like, and suddenly felt the horror of the Arzamas night awaken within me. My God, must I stay here for the night? How can I? I thought. Will you kindly unfasten my bag? I said to the porter to keep him longer in the room. And now I'll dress quickly and go to the theater, I said to myself. When the bag had been untied, I said to the porter, Please tell the gentleman in number eight, the one who came with me, that I shall be ready presently and ask him to wait for me. The porter left, and I began to dress in haste, afraid to look at the walls. But what nonsense, I said to myself. Why am I frightened like a child? I am not afraid of ghosts. Ghosts. To be afraid of ghosts is nothing to what I was afraid of. But what is it? Absolutely nothing. I am only afraid of myself. Nonsense. 
I slipped into a cold, rough, starched shirt, stuck on the studs, put on evening dress and new boots, and went to call for the Kharkov landowner, who was ready. We started for the opera house. He stopped on the way to have his hair curled, while I went to a French hairdresser to have mine cut, where I talked a little to the French woman in the shop and bought a pair of gloves. Everything seemed all right. I had completely forgotten the oblong room in the hotel and the walls. I enjoyed the Faust performance very much, and when it was over my companion proposed that we should have supper. This was contrary to my habits, but at that moment I remembered the walls in my room and accepted. We returned home after one. I had two glasses of wine, an unusual thing for me, in spite of which I was feeling quite at ease. But the moment we entered the passage, with the lowered lamp lighting it, the moment I was surrounded by the peculiar smell of the hotel, I felt a cold shudder of horror running down my back. But there was nothing to be done. I shook hands with my new friend and stepped into my room. I had a frightful night, much worse than the night at Arzamas, and it was not until dawn, when the old man in the next room was coughing again, that I fell asleep, and then not in my bed, but after getting in and out of it many times, on the sofa. I suffered the whole night unbearably. Once more my soul and my body were tearing themselves apart within me. The same thoughts came again. I am living. I have lived up till now. I have the right to live. But all around me is death and destruction. Then why live? Why not die? Why not kill myself immediately? No, I could not. I am afraid. Is it better to wait for death to come when it will? No, that is even worse, and I am also afraid of that. Then I must live. But what for? In order to die? I could not get out of that circle. I took a book and began reading. For a moment it made me forget my thoughts, but then the same questions and the same horror came again. I got into bed, lay down, and shut my eyes. That made the horror worse. God had created things as they are, but why? They say, don't ask, pray. Well, I did pray. I was praying now, just as I did at Arzamas. At that time I prayed simply, like a child. Now my prayers had a definite meaning. If thou exists, reveal thy existence to me. To what end am I created? What am I? I was bowing to the earth, repeating all the prayers I knew, composing new ones, and I was adding each time, reveal thy existence to me. I became quiet, waiting for an answer. But no answer came, as if there were nothing to answer. I was alone, alone with myself, and was answering my own questions in place of him who would not answer. What am I created for? To live in a future life, I answered. Then why this uncertainty and torment? I cannot believe in future life. I did believe when I asked, but not with my whole soul. Now I cannot, I cannot. If thou didst exist, thou wouldst reveal it to me, to all men. But thou dost not exist, and there is nothing true but distress. But I cannot accept that. I rebel against it. I implore him to reveal his existence to me. I did all that everybody does, but he did not reveal himself to me. Ask, and it shall be given unto you, I remembered, and began to entreat. In doing so I felt no real comfort, but just surcease of despair. Perhaps it was not entreaty on my part, but only denial of him. You retreat a step from him, and he goes from you a mile. I did not believe in him, and yet here I was entreating him, but he did not reveal himself to me. I was balancing my accounts with him, and was blaming him. I simply did not believe. The next day I used all my endeavors to get through with my affairs, somehow, during the day, in order to be saved from another night in the hotel room. Although I had not finished everything, I left for home in the evening. That night at Moscow brought a still greater change into my life, which had been changing ever since the night at Arzamas. I was now paying less attention to my affairs, and grew more and more indifferent to everything around me. My health was also getting bad. My wife urged me to consult a doctor. To her, my continual talk about God and religion was a sign of ill health. 
whereas I knew I was ill and weak because of the unsolved questions of religion and of God. I was trying not to let that question dominate my mind and continued living amid the old, unaltered conditions, filling up my time with incessant occupations. On Sundays and feast days I went to church. I even fasted, as I had begun to do since my journey to Pensa, and did not cease to pray. I had no faith in my prayers, but somehow I kept the demand note in my possession instead of tearing it up, and was always presenting it for payment, although I was aware of the impossibility of getting paid. I did it just on the chance. I occupied my days, not with the management of the estate. I felt disgusted with all the business because of the struggle it involved, but with the reading of papers, magazines, and novels, and with card playing for small stakes. The only outlet for my energy was hunting. I had kept that up from habit, having been fond of this sport all my life. One day in winter, a neighbor of mine came with his dogs to hunt wolves. Having arrived at the meeting place, we put on snowshoes to walk over the snow and move rapidly along. The hunt was unsuccessful. The wolves contrived to escape through the stockade. As I became aware of that from a distance, I took the direction of the forest to follow the fresh track of a hare. This led me far away into a field. There I spied the hare, but he had disappeared before I could fire. I turned to go back and had to pass a forest of huge trees. The snow was deep, the snowshoes were sinking in, and the branches were entangling me. The wood was getting thicker and thicker. I wondered where I was, for the snow had changed all the familiar places. Suddenly I realized that I had lost my way. How should I get home or reach the hunting party? Not a sound to guide me. I was tired and bathed in perspiration. If I stopped, I would probably freeze to death. If I walked on, my strength would forsake me. I shouted, but all was quiet, and no answer came. I turned in the opposite direction, which was wrong again, and looked around. Nothing but the wood on every hand. I could not tell which was east or west. I turned back again, but I could hardly move a step. I was frightened and stopped. The horror I had experienced in Arzamas and in Moscow seized me again, only a hundred times greater. My heart was beating, my hands and feet were shaking. Am I to die here? I don't want to. Why death? What is death? I was about to ask again, to reproach God, when I suddenly felt I must not. I ought not. I had not the right to present any account to him. He had said all that was necessary, and the fault was wholly mine. I began to implore his forgiveness, for I felt disgusted with myself. The horror, however, did not last long. I stood still one moment, plucked up courage, took the direction which seemed to be the right one, and was actually soon out of the wood. I had not been far from its edge when I lost my way. As I came out on the main road, my hands and feet were still shaking, and my heart was beating violently. But my soul was full of joy. I soon found my party, and we all returned home together. I was not quite happy but I knew there was a joy within me which I would understand later on, and that joy proved real. I went to my study to be alone, and prayed, remembering my sins and asking for forgiveness. They did not seem to be numerous, but when I thought of what they were, they were hateful to me. Then I began to read the scriptures. The Old Testament I found incomprehensible, but enchanting, the new touching in its meekness, but my favorite read was now the lives of the saints. They were consoling to me, affording example which seemed more and more possible to follow. Since that time I have grown even less interested in the management of affairs and in family matters. These things even became repulsive to me. Everything was wrong in my eyes. I did not quite realize why they were wrong, but I knew that the things of which my whole life consisted now counted for nothing. This was plainly revealed to me again on the occasion of the projected purchase of an estate, which was for sale in our neighborhood on very advantageous terms. I went to inspect it. Everything was very satisfactory, the more so because the peasants on that estate had no land of their own beyond their vegetable gardens. I grasped at once that in exchange for the right of using the landowner's pasture grounds, they would do all the harvesting for him, and the information I was given proved that I was right. 
I saw how important that was, and was pleased, as it was in accordance with my old habits of thought. But on my way home I met an old woman who asked her way, and I entered into conversation with her, during which she told me about her poverty. On returning home, when telling my wife about the advantages the estate afforded, all at once I felt ashamed and disgusted. I said I was not going to buy that estate, for its profits were based on the sufferings of the peasants. I was struck at that moment with the truth of what I was saying, the truth of the peasants having the same desire to live as ourselves, of their being our equals, our brethren, the children of the Father, as the Gospel says. But unexpectedly, something which had been gnawing within me for a long time became loosened and tore away, and something new seemed to be born instead. My wife was vexed with me and abused me, but I was full of joy. This was the first sign of my madness. My utter madness began to show itself about a month later. This began by my going to church. I was listening to the Mass with great attention and with a faithful heart, when I was suddenly given a wafer, after which one began to move forward to kiss the cross, pushing each other on all sides. As I was leaving church, beggars were standing on the steps. It became instantly clear to me that this ought not to be, and in reality was not. But if this is not, then there is no death and no fear, and nothing is being torn asunder within me, and I am not afraid of any calamity which may come. At that moment the full light of the truth was kindled in me, and I grew into what I am now. If all this horror does not necessarily exist around me, then it certainly does not exist within me. I distributed on the spot all the money I had among the beggars on the porch, and walked home instead of driving in my carriage as usual. And all the way I talked with the peasants. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed God Sees the Truth But Waits and Diary of a Lunatic by Leo Tolstoy. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.